Greetings and welcome back to From the Tomes. We're finally getting back on track with some full production content here with our continuing talk on world building for RPGs and fiction. Some of you know a bit of this was already discussed in an open forum chat over on my Twitch channel. I'm there on Wednesday nights with topical chat discussions on aspects of TTRPG gaming, related talk on movies, books, music, and some general great discussion. I'd love for you to come join me there as well. Thanks again to everyone for tuning in to the huge success this channel is having with all of its likes and views. This is the second episode in my series on world building. In the last video, I talk about the initial choices you have to make and what should factor into those choices. I also provide research tips and examples of how I started the development of my own world as Varna for my game, Tales of the Harrowed Land. It isn't necessary to watch that video before this one, but I do recommend checking it out if you haven't already. As the title implies, in this video, we'll talk about the next logical steps once you decide on the basics of your world's makeup. That would be mapping out the geography, and more than making the maps, how to make geographic features unique and memorable. Maps form the basis of most RPG worlds whether that is a tabletop or a computer game. When we talk about our game experience, we often relate personal experiences of interactions and actions our characters take, those scenes in which we're really excited about our characters' exploits. But when we first think of a specific game world, we often picture that place as map. They can either be the literal God's eye view of the world's body, or they can be a representation of what the world's inhabitants believe their home looks like. Take, for example, this medieval map drawn by an Iberian monk in 766. It appears to be an interpretation of our own world, but has what we would consider fantasy elements. It places the Garden of Eden in Asia and indicates the existence of a fourth continent that at that time would have only been speculation. The map is no more accurate than that of most fantasy worlds. At some point, I'll be exploring the possibility of a game map being a creative work in lieu of the exact representation of the game setting. But for now, let's assume you're going to accurately map your landscape. It's a natural tendency to want to create an entire and expansive, all-encompassing continent or realm right off the bat. After all, in many cases, what we see and what we get enthralled by are visions of these new worlds when we're first opening up a new game book. But don't forget, many of these worlds have been in development for years and have undergone extensive playtesting, and player feedback has helped form the landscape and form the map. You have likely already made decisions or are working on your final vision of the type of climate and geography that will be represented, but let's cover a bit of what was talked about in the introductory video again. Most representations of geography and climate are simplistic. They tend to be made easily accessible by creating an environment which is analogous to that of our own world, or else exaggerations of that. Many times, sci-fi and fantasy worlds have a uniform biosphere, such as a jungle planet, which is uniformly a tropical jungle, or an ice world, which is made entirely of ice. But this doesn't take into account the nuances and specifics of geography that make up climate and ecology. What I cover here can be applied to any geographic makeup, but it is created with a diverse biology and geography in mind. Before those first lines are drawn, you're going to want to develop the geography, nature, and the scope of the area to be represented. And you have to make the most important decision. Why are you mapping the areas that you are? How will this foundational choice affect the rest of the game development process? What kind of people live there? And therefore, what kind of stories do you want to tell with the land you are deciding? Then, dig into plausible geography to support these stories. There is this tendency, especially in fantasy games, to just skin aspects of our historic world, roughly 1000 AD to 1600 AD, and simply drop new names and a vague shift in geography into it. Then the characters that populate this land tend to be your usual collection of knights, wizards, bards, sometimes with vague historical references, but more often drawn from fantasy cultures. Sometimes there are elves and dwarves, 
below the mountain or in the woods thrown in for good measure. These tend to be, at least in the early development, lacking in context between the cultural evolution of the people and the landmass itself. After the world's name, which we talk about extensively in the previous video, the world map is one of the key things that prospective players will see and remember. It should be interesting to look at and whet an appetite for exploration without the players or the game master even knowing the details of the world locations. Think of the map as one of the key selling points of your world. What I won't spend a lot of time on here is the actual physical method you choose to map out your world. I personally start with all sketches on paper. Then I usually move to some digital drawing medium, a tablet or a pad, to make easily adjustable digital sketches. All that will be determined by your own preference, time, skill set, and resources. In nearly all cases, I would go to a professional illustrator to make the final publication level map. To me though, it's ultimately satisfying to sit and sketch and draw and think about these unique details that I'm going to want to put into this world eventually. Let's compare two worlds that I've recently mapped out for RPGs. The first is the land of Haros for Blight Realms by Golden Dragon Studios. This is an early prototype of the map which was rendered in Photoshop, long after I had hand sketched probably a dozen shapes and layouts. I had to think carefully about the shape of the continent and what any resulting landmass features would do to the feel of the world, especially as I planned for sections of the world to be overwhelmed by a supernatural disease called the Blight. The most current pre-Kickstarter map was rendered by an illustrator and looks like this. Obviously, it's a more professional and complete drawing, and pulls in potential players with its visual beauty. I began looking at historical and political constructs from about 500 AD onward. I had an idea that this world would be an analog of our own low medieval era, approximately 1100 AD. The political structure would be composed of city-states and feudal kingdoms, not dissimilar to what we have in popular fantasy role-playing games. The twist, of course, is that the kingdom is actually in the midst of a zombie apocalypse supernatural invasion, a plague, and much of what was has become unstable. So I began to think about historical analogs, minus the zombies. A few obvious references came to mind. Plagues, from the Roman era up through the 1600s, are an obvious reference. But I needed something more tangible to draw upon, so I began to think of the barbarian invasions of Rome, and later the Mongol conquests into what is now Russia and Eastern Europe. What sort of disruptions occurred? That dictated where and how I placed the blight, the infected areas that were undergoing the invasion of the undead. And how would it be impacted by geographic features? But even before I researched a physical and political geography of a similar makeup and proportion, I began to consider scale, population spread, the general tone of the culture as it would mesh with the land features. I finally decided to use a landmass that was roughly the size of Charlemagne's empire, with general cultural characteristics to what we would have found in that era. While the blight has rendered most of the eastern half of the continent dangerous to humans, I determined that before the blight, this area would have been largely flatlands with mountainous rises making up its borders. Perhaps there were now decayed but once rich forests. The large eastern mountain change was inspired by the Urals of Russia, and in that case, it's a boundary between hilly river countries and eastern Europe, and then the great plains of the great Eurasian steppes to the east. Of particular interest to me was the Danube region, with the namesake river flowing from the central German mountains to the hilly plains of the Slavic countries of Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. Also prominent there are Drava, Sava, and Mures, smaller rivers that provide fertile farmland that make up the region's interior. I decided this would be an excellent resource for the Kath River, 
which would begin in the northern mountain regions of the still habitable Tricked Mountains and the Cath Woods, and then flow east and south across the continent into what has become the Blightlands. Along that river's path, I determined the cultures and people that cropped up would be somewhat recognizable to our own world analogs. There's a strong Western European Germanic or Anglo naming convention to the west and north of the river's path with the language taking on a more Slavic and Balkan tone as you move into the eastern portion of the continent. At the furthest east of the landmass are places with names like the Ixokan River and the Strakotan River, which began to take on the linguistic qualities of Balkan-influenced names. I looked at the names of rivers in the eastern central Russian region, and they have names like Rekadyalka, and the Guava, two rivers in Russia that adopt less and less anglicized name structures as they begin to edge closer to the Eurasian region and the Eurasian linguistic roots. I spent a good amount of time also reading about the specifics of mountain ranges and how they form. You don't necessarily need to chart out a million years of historic geography and tectonic plate movement for your world, but it helps to think about real-world physics and geological history when determining where to place things like mountain ranges. By looking at some real-world topographic maps, you can see the general trends as far as what type of features tend to mass near each other. In the world of Haros, the mountain ranges edge the larger planar area, indicating that the middle of the continent is largely a flat land. One center ridge of mountains indicates that two or more ancient land masses are coming together. I envisioned it to some degree like the Midwest through the Great Plains of the United States, or as previously mentioned, the steppes of Russia. The names of the mountain ranges similarly followed that to which I laid out for the rivers. They would not be out of place in our own familiar lands, English, German, French, and perhaps even Spanish-influenced names to the West. Then to the East, you find names that are closer to a Balkan or a Eurasian naming convention. I also decided the climate would be more or less like our own Europe during the Middle Ages. It is estimated that aside from a few given warm periods and cold periods, it was roughly like our own. Hotter summer seasons, cold, icy winters, temperate equinox seasons, and supernatural effects aside, it would be fairly recognizable as familiar weather patterns. In my previous video, I discuss avoiding exactly what I just did, which is to make a world that is analogous to our own and simply change names. Generally, that doesn't seem all that convincing, at least not without significant research into naming sources and cultures to back up this decision. But in this case, I wanted a world that was intentionally familiar. I've heard the world compared to both Warhammer's Old Kingdoms and the continent of The Witcher, and I certainly referenced sources that were similar to both of these role-playing worlds. And that, of course, is our own Central to Eastern Europe. The opinion of the Blight Realms, though, is a zombie apocalypse and a cult-driven horror. The world has been largely overrun or is in the process of being overrun by undead forces. I could have easily said it in Charlemagne's reign, but we wanted Haros to seem familiar enough that a threat to the world would be tangible, yet not rely on being bound to our own historical timeline, especially because we wanted to add our own unique magic, our own unique character types, and flavors that would not have fit into historical Europe. The second world map is still at a very basic level and covers a much more compact area. This is the land of Asvarna, in which Tales of the Harrowed Land is set. If you've seen the world building video, I discuss why I use a smaller, more isolated part of a continental landmass as a starting area. The New Kingdoms are the known inhabited lands of Asvarna. They are approximately 900 kilometers in length from north to south, and about half that at the widest point east to west. This is just a bit larger than the country of Germany. It's similarly proportioned. It's maybe closer to the size of the American state of Montana. This is of course a smaller landmass and part of a much greater continent, 
but I opted to make it a focused area so that I could explore it deeply and realistically. And it also feeds the narrative of a re-emerging civilization that has been confined to a smaller area. For this land, I decided to go further back than the medieval era. I had it in mind that the feel of the world would be something like our own Mesopotamian era. Maps of the Fertile Crescent region show a land very similar to what I imagined as I began to model the New Kingdoms. These maps show a large area that is flat and farmable. Moist fields are fed by rivers and ringed by hills and highlands. The New Kingdoms have a large forest on the western border. This is where it departs from our own Fertile Crescent region. This is a relatively new growth and rooted in the world's lore as being fed by magical energy. The southern stretch of the coast of the New Kingdom becomes rocky and lined with steep limestone cliffs that descend abruptly into the sea. These were based on the cliffs of the Elba River on the border of Germany and the Czech Republic. These are called the Bistai, and they are massive natural pillars of rock that create sweeping and tall formations. These cliffs in Asvarna became known as the Rinkiri. While these mountains may have had various names given by people who populated the area over thousands of years, Rinkiri was given to the mountain range by the Meluk, the herders, riders, and indigenous people of the plains. It comes from the Meluk phrase meaning wander or to wander. As I imagine, similarly to the Bastai, there would be deep, narrow canyons and gulches cut within the stone pillars. The way through them are long and maze-like rock ravines. I even hint that the earliest Melic tribesmen believed their dead, who could not return to their spiritual ancestral lands, would wander these passages. Strange creatures roam the mountain range, a rare sort of hyena-wolf hybrid, making them dangerous to traverse. But also within the Rinkiri are rumored to be remnants of lost places, abandoned cliff dwellings by the people who once lived there. Unlike the Bastai, the Rinkiri aren't an isolated cluster of pillars rising out of dense wood. They border the plains to the west, north, and south, and then the east are seaward. There, they drop off dramatically into the ocean, similar to the cliffs of Dover. The only people venturing regularly into the place are salt miners, mostly Meluk and a few Hapshar from the nearby settlements. There are sparse outposts in the barren valleys. This gives an opportunity to not only create a memorable geographic feature, but tie it into the world's lore. All of this came from researching a real-life example. It not only fuels the imagination, but it gives you a believable sense to the geography. I decided to make the mountains a key feature of this land, as much of a feature as the Great Plains and the swampy Magra Peninsula, which I talk about in the first video. The Triagar which are on the western edge of the New Kingdoms, are loosely based on the Alps. They're highly peaked, rising out of the plains to the east, and to the west, there's the Great Forest. They've been inhabited for a millennia and contain remnant cultures that survived the infestation due to their isolation. The nearest modern population center is Nakarth, now ruled by the degenerate Hapshar. I envision this as perhaps an Iron Age fantastic city that is somewhere between historical Lucerne and Melnabon in turn. From all along the known lands, the three sisters, the tallest spires of the Triagar, tower above the lower mountains, and these peaks from a distance seem to rise directly out of the plains. I decided to name these peaks to give them personality. Elaf, Vinda, and Orusu. Vinda is the highest at 6,000 meters. Elaf stands at 4,900 meters. Orusu is the shortest sibling at 2,200 meters. It is storied that the mountains are giant monument stones to fallen gods and goddesses who are known by those names. There are high caves in the peaks, sometimes with strange undying guardians, watching over ancient shrines that can grant unique insight and powers. While a base of white limestone, these mountains are striated with purple and green hues from rich mineral and gemstone deposits. And only the lowest reaches of these mountains have been extensively mined and explored. 
I took the inspiration from the Matterhorn, which also inspired Caladris from Lord of the Rings, as well as Mount Blanc and Liscum and other famous alpine peaks. Foothills to the east become arid and windswept with bony trees and eventually flatten into the Great Plains, while to the west they become lushly forested with crooked brush that creeps out of the haunted Neogi forests. The goal in all of my choices is to create a landscape with real personality. I've considered each of the major geographic regions and tied their lore into the land's history, and most importantly, into the culture of the people. The question comes in then, why not make something really outrageous, like a donut-shaped land mass around a great lake or chasm? Why not make a strange place with floating rock platforms big enough to hold towns and cities? And I agree, why not? But as I say with my discussion on choosing unique planetary types, do these choices add to your story? Can you make it convincing enough and believable enough to your players? Perhaps for a very high fantasy game like Dungeons & Dragons, there, there isn't as much onus to make a realistic sense of geography and maps. Some environments, such as the Underdark or a magical forest or dungeon, you might in fact want the opposite. Maybe it's better to fully embrace the magical opinion of the world's working and have features that are irrational or impossible in our world. But if you're thinking of conceiving an entire world, there should be an internal logic, even if that logic is governed by magic. And if working with something entirely alien, that structure requires a lot more work to substantiate. Because magic can be a reasonable setting device, as long as there is some consistency to the strange occurrences, I found it more believable to have a world that is somewhat familiar with magical spots that defy reality. These make for memorable encounters. This video, along with all of these early episodes discussing the topic of world building, are painted with very broad strokes. Every writer and world builder has their own approach. But having now designed two game worlds meant for publication, and quite a few more as a hobby, I find this process is consistent in developing worlds that the players find believable and interesting. As always, thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and of course, if you have, like it and please subscribe to my channel. Don't forget, you can find links to this YouTube channel, to my Twitch stream, and more at fromthetomes.com. You can follow the updates on the game worlds I have discussed at both harrowedlandrpg.com and goldendragonstudio.com. And also, don't forget, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Fox and Boar Games, all one word. A website for that will be appearing soon. Just remember, everything I give here is a suggestion. Something that you can take and use as fuel when you begin designing your own worlds. Take it and run with it. Build your dreams. Never hesitate to get in touch via direct messaging, comment. Feel free to ask me questions or leave me feedback. I love hearing what everybody's thinking. Tell me what you agree with about this video, or what you like about this video, or what you don't like or you disagree with. I enjoy hearing all of it, and I really take it all to heart. And again, a giant thank you for everybody who's been tuning into this media. Until next time, most of all, have fun making your game.